thank you all for uh, making time to come here in this, in, with all this beauty outside and actually uh, sharing some of this work and ideas together with us. So um, since Cliff said that uh, we should introduce ourselves, since I wouldn't forget, I thought I'd use some pictures to remind me. So uh, I was trained in psychoneuroimmunology by two awesome mentors amongst uh, a few others. Uh, but my main mentors were Bruce McEwen here, uh, who was uh, my mentor for neuroscience, uh, stress neurobiology, and uh, many other things. And then Ralph Steinman here was my mentor for immunology. So I was really very, very fortunate and I'm very grateful to have had the mentorship of two great individuals and great scientists uh, who trained me essentially to be in the field of psychoneuroimmunology. Um, some more about myself. Well, uh, my family is a major part in uh, enabling me to do this work that I do. And I must say that they are very compassionate in uh, helping me deal with things. So that's my wife and my sons, and they're sitting right there in the audience. Um, and then, although I work with stress and immunity, as you will see uh, soon, again, it's thanks to Jim and Sea Care that I have become extremely interested in the idea of compassion and how one might study it and how it might contribute to increasing and enabling, um, you know, a salubrious, a health-promoting behaviors. And I'll share some of those ideas with you in my talk. Um, also, importantly, um, a, a lot of the work that I'm going to be talk with, talking about today, almost all of it, would not have been possible without an awesome team of students, research assistants, trainees that I've been blessed to have. And these are pictures of uh, many of the recent folks, but not everybody who has contributed in my lab to the studies that I'm going to be briefly mentioning. Don't worry, Cliff, I'm not going to go through all the studies. Cliff is like, oh, God, is he going to shut up ever? And then these are pictures of my many collaborators, again, for whom I'm extreme, to whom I'm extremely grateful for, again, allowing us to conduct the studies, some of which I'll share with you. So to give you an outline, I'm going to start by talking about good stress, then I'll talk briefly about bad stress, and then I will try to explain some thoughts and hypotheses about how we think compassion fits into this equation, and how it may contribute to shifting the balance from the negative effects of bad stress towards the positive effects of good stress. So typically when we think about stress, we think about stress as a big, bad, pathological entity. So here's a poster from the National Library of Medicine that says stress is a loaded gun. It says if left untreated, stress can kill you just as surely as a bullet. It says don't wait for the gun to go off. Get help today. Can I uh, request you to consider two things with me? One is that Mother Nature did not give us the stress response to kill us. Okay. And secondly, she gave us the stress response to help us survive. So how exactly sort of do we deal with this concept? So we have a working definition of stress where we define it as a constellation of events that begins with a stimulus, the stressor, that precipitates a reaction in the brain. This is stress perception that then results in the activation of fight or flight systems in the body. This is your physiological, biological stress response. And without changes in the biological stress response, it really doesn't matter to the body or brain what's happening outside. So you need that biological response to have the effects of stress take place. We find it very useful to categorize stress into two broad groups. So one is acute or short-term stress that we specifically define as stressors or activation of the biological stress response that lasts for minutes to hours in duration, maximum of about four to six hours. We also define, bless you, chronic or long-term stress as stress that lasts for months to years in duration. Okay, and a very important to distinguish between the two. So, everyone would agree that if a predator like a lion or a cheetah walked into this room, pretty much all of us would have a stress response that would consist of an increase in heart rate, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, and recently we and others are fight finding that cytokines, traditionally thought to be the domain of the immune system, are also increased in significant amounts in the bloodstream in response to purely psychological stressors. But, well, giving a, giving a talk like I am doing now, you see, the Sea Care Symposium, okay, can also activate the same biological response that a predator would activate. But we often don't appreciate that voluntarily jumping onto a treadmill, or out here you don't need a treadmill, you can run around the uh, in the beautiful mountains, also activates the same biological response that would be activated by a predator. And finally, getting more exotic, approaching someone for a first kiss especially if the person doing the approaching is romantically challenged, also would activate the same biological stress response. So appreciating this, 
You also, we need to appreciate that the stress response is also instantly activated during medical procedures like vaccination, surgery, and blood draws. And these are both my boys. So this is the older one, and this is the younger one getting their shots. And I go to the, to the pedi pediatrician's office with multiple cameras every time they're going to get their vaccinations because I want to catch the best angle. And if I had more time, I'd show you a little movie that ends with the nurse saying, I'm sorry I couldn't make him cry more. Okay. <laughs> So the stress response is intrinsically coupled with medical and other procedures, but surprisingly it has been largely ignored by medical science. So our central hypothesis was that just as the stress response prepares the cardiovascular, the musculoskeletal, and the neuroendocrine systems for fight or flight, under some conditions it may prepare the immune system for challenges, such as wounding or infection, that may be imposed by the actions of a stressor. In other words, short-term stressors will enhance immune function in compartments like the skin that are likely to be compromised by the actions of a stressor. A stressor could be a predator out in the wild in nature, but it could be the process of undergoing surgery in clinical situations. So most research is very understandably focused on long-term or chronic stress, but we also find that it is important to investigate and harness personally as well as clinically if possible, the protective effects of the short-term or acute stress response. So I'll give you a, 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 a brief sort of description of where we, we've gone with this. So how does the immune system react during short-term stress? That's one of the first questions we asked. And I'm showing you data from one of many, many studies that shows you changes in immune cell numbers in the bloodstream of a person undergoing the short-term stress of surgery. This is knee surgery. And here you're looking at killer T cells, but the same applies for many other immune cell types. And what you see is that compared to the baseline, which we took at the patient's home, just before surgery, there is an anticipatory increase in, in cell numbers in the blood. Then cell numbers in the bloodstream go down, and then they recover back to baseline. Okay. So what exactly do these changes mean? Very importantly, these are my major collaborators on this, on this study, knee surgery study. Alyssa Apple, who was at Yale when we started the study, and now she's at UCSF. Alyssa and I still work together. Jeanette Ikovic, who was really the principal investigator of this study, who kept the whole thing going at, at, at Yale, while Alyssa and I jumped across the country over to the West Coast. And then Peter Jokel, who really was the main surgeon on this study and personally did all the surgeries for the data that I'm going to share with you about in a couple of slides from now. So what does this up-down change, this acute stress-induced change in immune cell numbers signify is one of the questions we wanted to ask. So I'm going to summarize about 15 years' worth of work and put together this model for you. Under resting conditions, immune cells, which are these little white balls, are like the body's soldiers. So they're sitting in their barracks under resting conditions. As soon as you have the beginning of a stress response, the cells quickly leave their barracks and the soldiers travel to the boulevards of the body, which are the blood vessels. And this registers as an increase in absolute numbers of immune cells in the blood early during stress or in the context of anticipating stress, anticipating stress, as you saw in the, in the previous slide. Now, if the stressor progresses, so this happens within about 5 to 15 minutes, as the stressor progresses, you see a decrease in immune cell numbers in the bloodstream, and this decrease does not represent a net loss of cells from the body, as was sometimes thought, but it represents a redistribution where the soldiers are now leaving the boulevards and entering potential battlefields in the body. Okay, potential battlefields, of which the skin and the skin-draining lymph nodes are major ones. The acute stress response not only sends more defenders to potential battles, battlefields, but it also increases their firepower. So it also increases their effectiveness for doing whatever, whatever it is their functions are. So the short-term stress response activates the body's defenses even before there is wounding or infection. So then the question was, does a short-term stress response experienced during surgery, vaccination, or cancer progression enhance immune function? And we and others have done several studies that show that, yes, indeed it does. If you couple a short-term stress response with vaccination, cancer progression, or immune function, you enhance that protective immunity. So you enhance recovery from surgery. I'll show you some data. Our colleagues, based on our preclinical work, have shown clinically that coupling a short-term stressor with a vaccination enhances the vaccine response, and we are just beginning to identify mechanisms by which the short-term protective stress biology can be used to enhance anti-tumor immunity. So let me give you a clinical example of the beneficial effects of short-term stress. So here is our knee surgery, the study that I referred to before, and here is the timeline. We collect a baseline sample at the patient's home, wait seven to 10 days, patient comes in for surgery, you get a pre-surgery blood sample, a post-surgery blood sample, and what we want to understand is whether patients who show that adaptive up-down profile of immune cell redistribution changes 
in the blood during the stress of surgery recover better than patients who show a maladaptive or essentially a non-redistributing flatline profile of immune cell numbers in the blood during the stress of surgery. We monitor recovery by using the LICE-HOME scale, which is one of the gold standard outcome measures for monitoring recovery from knee surgery. So here is the data. You're looking at, again, knee function as the Lysome scale measured over a year on out after surgery. And what you see here is that the patients who show that up-down profile of surgery stress-induced redistribution of immune cells recover earlier, they show significantly faster recovery, and they show a very high maximal recovery compared to patients who essentially flatline, do not redistribute their immune cells during the stress of surgery. And these folks here never attain the full maximal recovery profiles of the patients who do redistribute their immune cells in a robust and efficient manner during the stress of undergoing surgery. So one of our goals then is to maximally harness the protective biology of short-term stress during clinically important uh, situations such as surgery, vaccination, and cancer therapy. So then the question is, what about bad stress? And what about bad stress? And how do we reconcile these immunoenhancing findings with the well-known stress-induced suppression or dysregulation of immune function? In other words, how does an adaptive system become maladaptive? And the answer is, it does so as you transition from this sharp, acute stress response to chronic stress. So there's lots of evidence that points to chronic stress having negative or deleterious effects on health. Okay. We and others have shown that there is a decrease in protective immune responses if the immune responses are measured following conditions where the individual has experienced chronic stress. What we also find is that not only does protective immunity decrease with chronic stress, but there is a low-level increase in pro-inflammation or inflammatory, unwanted inflammatory responses that occur in conjunction with chronic stress. We've also seen that there is increased biological aging. So with Alyssa Apple and Elizabeth Blackburn and colleagues, I was fortunate to be involved with a study that looked at chronic stress and shortening of telomeres in immune cells. So telomeres are like these ends that cap the ends of the chromosomes and prevent them from fraying as cells undergo uh, replication. And the shorter the telomere is, suggests that the more biologically aged the cell type is. And what we found is that if you look at women who have different amounts or experiencing different amounts of chronic stress, those on the high end of the chronic stress spectrum, the women on the high end of the chronic stress spectrum, show an effective biological age as measured by their telomere shortening that is the equivalent of 10 years greater than women on the low end of the chronic stress spectrum. So two women who are 30 years old, the one on the chronic stress and her, her immune cell telomeres will look like they're 40 years old. Then chronic stress has also been shown to, to decrease mental and physical health in different ways. And also with many studies, studies conducted by many investigators, shown to increase susceptibility to infectious disease. This is both preclinical clinical studies, uh, increased susceptibility to cancer progression, uh, increase the risk and susceptibility to cardiovascular disease, and is connected with increased depression. So there's no doubt that these chronic long-term stressors have bad effects. So what we propose is it's important and useful to look at stress as a spectrum of possibilities. So at one end of the spectrum, you have the good stress, which is what I've been you know, talking about until we hit the chronic stress slide. At the other end of the spectrum, you have bad stress. This is that long-term stressors. And essentially, the timing is defined in reference to the amount of time for which stress factors are elevated in the bloodstream. So that's what the timing refers to. This involves minutes to hours of elevation in stress-related factors and physiological changes. And this, we define at least, as lasting for months to years on end. And what's very important is that between good stress and bad stress, or between acute stress and chronic stress, there is this low stress resting zone, which is your psychophysiological equilibrium. This is where one wants to be for most of the time, but one never need to be afraid of this response as long as you're basically sort of leading a healthy life and having sufficient time in that green zone. Now what you want for good health, we are beginning to believe, is the following. You want to minimize your exposure to this chronic stressor, you want to maximize the magnitude and duration of this green zone for yourself. And you want to maximize your ability to mount robust, punctate, short-term stress responses when you need them, such as when you're starting to give a talk or undergoing surgery or um, you know, getting a vaccine and so on.
So there are different ways we believe, and a lot of this is, 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 is more in the hypothesis stage right now, but we do know and we do have data that suggests that good sleep, sleep that makes you feel rested the following morning, nutrition, exercise in moderation, meditation, yoga, dance, exercise, art, music, fishing, neurosurgery for some, gym maybe, okay, are all ways in which you might reduce that chronic stress burden, maximize the time spent in that green zone of equilibrium, and maximize your ability to mount these protective fight-or-flight stress responses when you need them. And what I want to hypothesize here, and actually studies conducted by some folks have already shown, I'll, I'll summarize them in the following slide, uh, suggest is that compassion may be one way, both giving compassion to others as well as receiving compassion from others, may be a very important way that enables you to get from this equilibrium to this more healthy equilibrium state. So as Tad and Chuck and, uh, have shown in their much cited and referred to at this meeting studies, uh, practicing compassion uh, um, actually decreases significant both emotional indices of stress as well as biological indices of stress. So right there we have evidence for what, what we were beginning to hypothesize a few years ago. Um, I found a study by Raykel and colleagues at Wisconsin that showed that patients receiving empathy really wasn't the study, but I said like, empathy, compassion, uh, from the practitioners, from their clinicians, actually recovered from the common cold much faster than patients who did not receive that adequate uh, amount of empathy. No problem, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll be okay on time. Um, and then with uh, you know, self-compassion, one can understand how Kristen Neff showed really beautifully this morning that it could really reduce stress, anxiety, depression, and a lot of those sort of ne negative emotional loading factors. Uh, the essential idea is don't be too hard on yourself, which is a very nice way of reducing your chronic stress burden. But I also thought that it's important to add, as Cl Cliff and I were speaking this afternoon, that don't go too easy either. Right? So again, with Mother Nature, it's always a question. I'm sure this is you know, uh, preaching to the choir here. Everybody here knows it's always a question of moderation, which really seems to be the principle that governs how nature works. It also is important to make time. So self-compassion is also important to make time for stress-reducing activities and then take action, meaning actually engage in those activities, which again could be meditation, yoga, hiking, dancing, you know, so on. It's different strokes for different folks, so it doesn't have to be meditation or levitation or neurosurgery, but whatever it is, the important thing is to find what works for oneself. So here is the schematic that I put together where it's important to understand that increasing compassion, both in terms of receiving it as well as giving it, may be a, main, a, a major pathway towards reducing chronic stress. There could be a nice positive feed-forward cycle in here so that the greater the compassion that you can feel or receive, the lower your chronic stress burden, which in turn allows you to be more compassionate and, uh, and, and receive in, in the same way. Uh, reducing chronic stress, we know, increases your resting equilibrium, so it increases the time spent in the green zone, and it increases the effectiveness of your fight or flight stress response, the protection that you receive there. And overall, if this equation could be inculcated in people, what it would is likely to result in is an increase in health and well-being. So our goals in terms of my laboratory are to maximally harness the biology of that good, protective, fight-or-flight stress response and to do whatever we can, to learn whatever we can, to work with whoever is interested in working with us, to reduce or eliminate that bad stress and maximize the zone of health and healing, whether it's a healthy person we are working with or whether it's a patient that we are dealing with. And as we were driving here, uh, we went to uh, the Ute Museum, and I saw this interesting uh, saying, it's a Native American saying, that my wife pointed out to me and said, hey, you know, you should take a picture of this. And when Jim introduced the meeting, um, the way he ended on the first day resonates a lot with what is said here, right? There can never be peace between nations until it is first known that a true peace is within the souls of men. And perhaps being compassion and being open to receiving compassion may be one way to get peace or increase the peace within our souls, which will hopefully increase the peace uh, overall the world over. Uh, if you're interested in some of this in narrative form, thanks again to Jim and Emma. I was able to put up a little post on, on what I was going to talk about today. It's in the Huffington Post. You don't need to try to memorize this URL. Just search for stress and compassion, and I think it'll show up. And again, this is a big, huge thank you to really all the folks who have played an extremely important role in enabling me to uh, be part of some of the studies that I've spoken with you about and the funding agencies, again, without which uh, almost none of this 
would have been possible. Thank you all again. I appreciate being here. Yeah.